Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos in our group reading of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. In this 29th lecture, we move on to the section of the text formerly titled Little A, The Struggle of the Enlightenment with Superstition, a particularly long section of the text going from paragraph 541 to paragraph 573, some 32 paragraphs in length, um, but also a particularly relevant section of the text to the present day because this debate between faith and skepticism, which is historically supposed to be situated in the 18th century in France, well, it continues in pretty much exactly the same form to the present day. We have figures like Richard Dawkins <laughs> exemplify just how little has changed within a few centuries, and for that reason, um, this is basically the part of the text where Richard Dawkins makes his typological appearance, and the Enlightenment, which he claims to offer, turns out of course, to not really be an enlightenment at all, as we will see over the course of this lecture, but I'd like to begin by thanking the patrons for um, supporting the channel. and remind you, you can Join us at the School for Bin Text for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. So if we open with paragraph 541, we find that although faith and the insight of the Enlightenment really are just two different sides of the same pure consciousness, um, in typical Hegelian fashion, they fail to realize this, and much like the slave and master we saw all the way back in section 5, they instead enter into a battle of mutually opposed stances, each of which claims to be the absolute. This repetition of that same conflict, in a certain sense, is unique, though, because um, the, the stance of faith and the stance of enlightenment actually are structurally asymmetrical to one another. As I mentioned in the last um, few lectures, faith gives us the picture of thinking, which it does not notionally grasp, but only reduplicates familiar earthly representations into the beyond. For example, the plurality of persons here on earth is um, reduplicated into the plurality of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, rather than no um, notionally understand them as giving rise to one another through a logical process. Um, um, and for that reason, um, faith gives us a content, but on the other hand, because the Enlightenment is just the purely negative mode of um, saying no to whatever faith <laughs> posits as a thesis about that beyond, um, and the Enlightenment is also unsatisfactory for the exact opposite reason. Faith gives us a content without a notional understanding of it, whereas the Enlightenment gives us the power of negativity, but one which is inherently devoid of any content, and is rather the pure vanishing of it, to use Hegel's own phrase. For this reason, in paragraph 542, we find that in this purely negative negation of whatever the content of faith happens to be, the Enlightenment remains totally dependent on the latter to supply it with an object of negation. Um, this really is the repetition of the skeptic in the literal sense that the Roman skeptic we met all the way back in section 6, who had no positive theories of his own except the purely negative idea that whatever the other person is saying is wrong, well, we basically find the same sort of skepticism reappear now. But even with that um, purely parasitic relation of negating whatever somebody else says, the rationalist skeptic now actually offers up several different kinds of explanations for why the believer is wrong, each of which is logically inconsistent with the other explanations. On one hand, the skeptic dismisses the entirety of faith as a quote-unquote tissue of superstitions, prejudices, and errors. That is to say, um, a delusion with no existence beyond a single mind which is out of touch with reality and just made up this content himself or herself. On the other hand, the skeptic claims that a vast conspiracy of priests and despots are of joined forces to willfully deceive the masses by feeding them so many lies in order to solidify political control over them. You've probably heard this theory many times that some evil king invented religion so he could um, enslave the people and um, get them to renounce their um, pursuit of material wealth in this life because they'd been duped into thinking they'd get a reward in the next life. You've heard this thesis many times, um, despite any a lack of historical evidence to prove that that happened, well, this is one of the other arguments of the skeptic now, but if you think about it very carefully, the, the, it's saying the exact opposite of what the first thesis claimed. The first thesis argued that the believer invented um, all of his religious beliefs in his own mind and genuinely believes in them, despite 
um, lacking any evidence that they're true. Um, but the second thesis says the exact opposite. It says that the believer did not invent those ideas himself. Somebody else put them into his mind, and the person who invented these did not fall for his own deception. He knew that they weren't true, but he still made other people believe it so that he could control them. So it's ironic that we have a purely logical contradiction here between the first thesis and the second. And coming from somebody who prides himself and, in fact, defines himself precisely as someone who uses logic and reason to go beyond what is mere belief for the, um, uh, the person who has faith um, in this beyond and all of the religious dogmas, etc. So it's interesting that um, even in terms of his own self-definition as a logical rationalist, um, we find that the skeptic is anything but that. But of course, we will need the entire lecture to find to see all of the reasons why we have this sort of um, failure on the part of the skeptic to be what he claims to be. At any rate, we will move on now to consider how in paragraph 543, although the skeptic in a certain sense opposes himself to three different types of people in the world, he opposes himself to the delusional believer, he opposes himself to the uh, wicked priest um, who is deceiving that believer, and of course he opposes himself to the, um, the malicious king who, of course, those priests are just serving. He's the guy who's really behind the scenes running this entire conspiracy. Um, the skeptic only really focuses his attention, his attention initially on the first of those three figures, and this is for the very specific reason that an individual mind imprisoned in its own delusions, superstitions, and errors is just another way of saying an inherently rational mind which simply awaits the liberation of the Enlightenment. In this case, the um, skeptic is not simply mean-spirited. He's not just a bully, he really is on an ethical mission to um, uh, cause people to awaken to their own power of rationality and, and in, a, in a certain sense, make the world a better place as a result of that liberation. At any rate, paragraph 544 notes that despite its desire to free the delusional believer from its own self-imposed captivity, the skeptic himself remains ambivalent in his attitude towards that believer. On one hand, he does recognize himself in that other as a potentially rational mind like his own, but because he cannot help but despise a mind tainted with such primitive superstitions, he cannot resolve his stance into either a purely friendly one or a purely hateful relation. This is much like the ambivalence which Freud would later um, take credit for inventing with regard to, you know, the ego both despises and loves the father. Well, we already have that. Just like so many other things Freud supposedly invented all the way here in Hegel in a much more interesting sense. Anyway, paragraph 545 notes that because the skeptic sees the believer as a less perfect version of himself, that is to say, as reason that has not yet been enlightened, he goes to war with the assurance that victory will be guaranteed to arrive quickly with no real casualties on either side, simply because his a figurative military is so much more powerful than the other. This is kind of like um, the way that Americans thought 20 years ago their own wars under Bush would unfold. It would be very quick, we would get the victory, and then we'd come home within a few weeks. Of course, that turned into 20 years instead. In a particularly memorable simile, Hegel compares this war of rational liberation to a quote-unquote silent expansion or diffusion, say of a perfume in the unresisting atmosphere, this idea that it would be like, you know, releasing perfume into the air and it would just spread, um, actually is, in a certain sense, right, because, um, the, there is no power in consciousness which could overcome the disease of rationality, to use Hegel's own um, phrase, because in this rationalistic use of one's own mental faculties, even the believer himself can easily recognize the essence of his own mind. Religious apologetics emerges as a systematic defense of traditional doctrine which uses the power of reason in a coincidence of supposed opposites which shocks the skeptic to the core. Although the skeptic was so certain that the idol of Christianity would be thrown to history's dustbin to join countless pagan deities of the vastly distant past which nobody believes in anymore, we can start to see cracks in this hope for a new serpent of wisdom to shed the old skin of Christianity and just keep on growing stronger in a linear trajectory of progress. It's actually not quite as simple as that.
In fact, paragraph 546 to 8, we find that the more the skeptic um, fights against its other, the more the skeptic ends up fighting against itself. For the more it tries to differentiate itself from that ignorant other, the more similar to it it actually becomes. Ironically enough, insight eventually becomes the untruth and unreason, and pure intention eventually becomes a lie in insincerity of purpose, to use Hegel's own phrases. Paragraph 548 notes more specifically that this passage into its exact opposite is the result of using that most rational of all tools, the category, which, as we saw all the way back in section 7, is the certainty of a unity between subjective and objective content. By this um, late phase of the phenomenology, though, category has evolved to the point that the skeptic affirms that all that is, is rational. But in so doing, the skeptic admits that insofar as he is fighting against some other out there, that other must also fall under this universal definition of rationality, something proven by the ability of that other to do religious apologetics with the power of reason alone. Um, worse yet, the thing the skeptic finds he is really fighting against is really just his own self. By paragraph 549, we finally get to see concretely what exactly the Enlightenment skeptic's complaints about the believer are when the skeptic launches the first um, campaign of deconstruction against that thinker by explaining away the entire world of belief as nothing more than a purely subjective delusion which that other mind has unwittingly tricked itself into believing is real, simply because that other mind has not yet been taught how to use its own intellectual faculties properly. But wait a minute, what exactly would using one's intellectual faculties properly look like? If we recall that the main conflict between faith and reason is the conflict between faith's picture thinking without notional comprehension and the Enlightenment's concept without inherent content, we now realize that the latter simply is the transcendence of all material content in favor of a purified concept, which is paradoxically more real than the bodily object it had left behind because it is more immaterial and more ideal than it. This is a formula, by the way, dating all the way back to medieval philosophy, um, which was ironically enough used at that time to prove God's superiority to man because Thomas Aquinas argued that um, the materiality and understanding are inversely related to one another. The body has a partial understanding through the five senses, which is um, categorically inferior to the real understanding of the mind in the sense that whereas the um, the eye can see colors, <laughs> the mind can contemplate the purified notion. And of course, whereas you and I are only kind of intelligent because we're trapped in physical bodies, God is perfectly intelligent because he has no physical body to give him this um, compromise between the imperfect and the perfect understanding. He simply is a purely immaterial mind who understands the notion um, at a level so high that you and I can only be in possession of truth to the extent that we um, accord our own minds with his. Well, it's ironic that now the rational skeptic is basically making the same argument about why his own um, negative um, notional thinking is superior to the lower content which the believer posits um, in the sense that he is also arguing that such notional um, thinking is superior because it leaves behind material reality in favor of something else. But then again, the accusation that faith is false because it's all in your head misses the irony that this is just another way of saying that faith is the immaterial concept of reason, and for that very reason is more real than the material reality which it admittedly retreats from. We find the skeptic and the believer um, in, in a certain sense passing over into one another the more they try to oppose one another. By paragraph 550, we find more ironic still is the way that the side which is supposed to stand for reason suffers from a strange case of amnesia, in which it immediately forgets its own previous argument and launches a second campaign of deconstruction, which directly contradicts the first, as I mentioned before, whereas um, 
The first argument claimed that faith is a delusion which the mind created for itself. And um, we hear the cliche to the present day that um, God didn't create us, we created him. Well, now the skeptic accuses the priesthood of willfully deceiving the ignorant masses by indoctrinating them with so many lies which they could never have imagined believing if they had not been bullied into it by organized religion. So then, which one is it? Is it all in your head, or was it invented by someone else and then forced upon you as an alien content which you had no part in creating? Clearly, one of these stances must be wrong, but the one who claims to be um, uh, superior because he thinks in accord with the laws of logic is the same one who is affirming both of these at the same time. Well, in paragraph 551, we find that the skeptic actually has a fairly poor understanding of the things which he tries to deconstruct rationally. For example, in paragraph 552, the, the same skeptic who just accused the believer of suffering from a mental delusion, which is false because it lacks any grounding in material reality, now accuses the same believer of remaining stuck in the materialism of fetishizing lower physical objects rather than rise up to the higher understanding of notion. Just as primitive peoples, quote-unquote, worship physical idols and then attribute magical powers to a piece of stone or a block of wood, to use Hegel's own um, examples, um, so too does the modern believer worship statues, religious icons, or supposed pieces of the cross which Jesus actually died on, as so many of those circulated in Europe, um, even up to the time of, say, Martin Luther, and I'm sure beyond then. So, once again, which one is it? Is the believer wrong because he's a materialist who fetishizes um, physical idols and attributes magical powers to them? Or is he wrong because he's an idealist who leaves behind the material realm of reality to inhabit an interior world populated own, uh, only by his own thoughts? Clearly, one of these stances must be wrong, but the rationalist is affirming both at the same time. Well, in paragraph 553, we find that the skeptic himself misses the point that the modern believer does not actually worship the icon of Jesus hanging on the church wall. He only uses it as a help to concentrate his... Um, his energy, his devotion, etc., on a spiritual figure which decidedly lies beyond this world. But that's just another way of saying that the believer has indeed transcended mere materiality to rise up to spirit through an understanding of this transcendent presence with the power of notion. Or as Hegel says himself, faith does not regard such things as stones, etc., um, as possessing intrinsic being. On the contrary, what has intrinsic being for faith is solely the essential being of pure thought. In paragraph 554, the skeptic launches yet another attack that only evidences, once again, how poorly he understands the other he is trying to deconstruct. Um, in claiming that the believers claim to a knowledge of an absolutely certain truth with eternal and universal validity is actually the worst form of dependency on the contingency of historical events in disguise, in that he is really just um, trying to prove the historical veracity of all of the events recorded in the Bible, a medium, of course, which grows ever more distant from the present moment as time passes, eventually making the events it claims to represent impossible for us to investigate as to their validity. Well, this dependency on chance historical events which occurred in the material world reveals faith's ironic materialism once again, which is so obviously inferior to the timeless certainty of the rational truths worked out by the mind without any dependence on empirical contingencies, which are of course what the skeptic um, favors in contrast with this, especially since it no longer has any access to the events which it is trying to talk about. In fact, by these criteria, we actually have more certainty in trying to base a new religion on the current events recorded in daily newspapers, says the skeptic, um, since at least those events are close enough to the present moment that we can um, get a better understanding of whether they actually happened or not. The skeptic misses the point once again, though, that the believer only bothers expending so much effort in trying to prove the historicity of the events recorded in the Bible, 
Only after the skeptic had corrupted him into doing so, Ken Ham's obsession with trying to reconstruct a life-size replica of Noah's Ark today, for example, in order to prove that such a feat really was accomplished millennia ago by a man who was hundreds of years old, well, that's unthinkable outside a historical context in which the predominance of Enlightenment-style reason had not forced even the believer himself to have to interpret biblical events as literal descriptions of scientific facts, rather than as hermeneutical disclosures of timeless spiritual truths. On paragraph 555 to 6, the skeptic launches the third attack by claiming that the believer's acts of renouncing worldly pleasures at the present moment for the sake of spiritual union with God for eternity are inevitably riddled with contradictions between what one says and what one really wants. This claim that any such act of sacrifice is by definition hypocritical and dishonest only reveals, however, the skeptic's own enslavement to materialism and his own failure to rise above that lower stance to the higher spiritual understanding which he is supposed to be championing. Well, in paragraph 557, the skeptic is finally put on the spot and asked, Okay, even if we accept your claim that all religion is bullshit, and if we agree to rid the earth of it once and for all, what on earth do you propose instead? Hegel dares to ask, what next? What is the truth of enlightenment that would be propagated in their stead? Well, because the skeptic had earlier dismissed any concrete content of, say, stone, wood, or clay as the primitive idolatry of merely particular real things, to use Hegel's own phrase, it is forced now to posit absolute being as a vacuum to which no determinations, no predicates, can be attributed, to quote Hegel himself. Paragraph 558, we find that the enlightened individual who turns this absolutely empty, absolute being into an object which can only be understood without um, taking a detour into any of the higher order predicates which would only distance us from that void. Well, this unwittingly reveals the supposedly advanced phase of the Enlightenment to be only the most primitive phase of sense certainty in disguise, albeit an educated sense certainty which has passed through the coordinated alienation of Bildung, but still arrives into the same void of an immediate certainty of nothing. Ironically, it reached this void precisely through trying to suspend the believers beyond and return back to the sense world which is present here and now, but of course we found all the way back in the first lecture that here and now are not really immediate at all. Those are universals. In much the same way, when the skeptic is put on the spot and asked to defend his own proposals for how to improve the ethical action which was supposedly um, always already vain and hypocritical when done by the believer, the skeptic responds by ironically plagiarizing the believer's own ideas but rebranding them in a secularized form. Whereas the believer repressed pathological desires here and now for the sake of a transcendent value in the beyond, the skeptic proposes utility as a way to combine this transcendence with the here and now. Whereas the believer tried to go beyond himself for the sake of vague religious goals which cannot be confirmed to exist until you reach the afterlife, the useful instead goes beyond itself but in a way which can be immediately confirmed in this life, in that it is useful for someone else. In fact, by paragraph 560, this pseudo-ontology, defined by the formula that, well, to be is to be useful, is turned back even on man himself. We find now that man's vocation is no longer to adhere to the most arbitrary religious mandates, which have no practical value, such as not eating meat on Friday or not working on Sunday, for which one can only trust that one will be rewarded in the afterlife for no reason except raw obedience to the church authorities. Well, instead of that, the enlightened individual now realizes that his duty simply is to make himself useful for the community here and now. Adam Smith returns in the phenomenology with um, another guest appearance declaring that so far as he serves others, so far is he taking care of himself. One hand washes the other in that the um, 
um, the act of making oneself useful for others in turn um, turns out to be useful for oneself as well. Well, in paragraph 561, the enlightened rationalist ends up concluding that if all things, even man himself, are to be understood best in terms of their usefulness, then this must be because they derived that characteristic from the absolute being, which before we could not say anything about it except in a certain sense that it is, well, now we know that the absolute uh, being is just pure utility in itself. Paragraph 562 notes that although the Enlightenment rationalist prides himself on having been clever enough to make up the utility deism of a god who is the supreme being for no reason except that he is the most useful among a universe of useful things, the believer properly recognizes this as an abomination which confuses the unknowable absolute with the all too knowable tools of this world. In addition, one can hear echoes of the earlier Roman phase now, as enlarging the quantity of property owned made the king, uh, excuse me, the emperor in a certain sense, um, the supreme um, person on the earth, but it did not actually tell us anything qualitatively about why that emperor deserved such a title. So too does being the most useful thing in a universe of use, uh, full of useful things, um, so too does that fail to tell us anything qualitatively about who God is. In paragraph 563, we find that faith legitimately feels itself to have been wronged by enlightenment because the latter has only ever distorted and altered its object of critique and has still failed to actually offer up any self-identical or consistent content of its own. Faith, for its part, simply is the self-identity of content of the absolute and is therefore structurally incompatible with the Enlightenment, even to the point that no real debate between the two can even be possible. Although it is true that neither can win, at the same time, neither can get away from the other, for both are tr um, two equal rights of spirit, to quote Hegel himself with one being simply the side of consciousness and the other being the side of self-consciousness qua negativity. Paragraph 564 to 5, we find that enlightenment simply exposes faith's own disavowed unconscious, but ironically remains unenlightened about its own disavowed unconscious. The deeper truth about insight, which insight itself fails to gain insight into, is that this negative power of a logical fluidity is not simply a way for the skeptic to show the other how much smarter he is. For this negativity really is the power of notion, yet for that very reason it is also the power of reconciliation rather than of deconstruction alone. Quite fittingly, Hegel goes on to show that faith and enlightenment share a strange underlying unity which remains invisible to both sides even as they obsess over the tiniest of details. Paragraph 566 to 71, we find in so many different ways that both sides are both right and wrong in their discussion of the absolute at the same time. But as a result of the skeptic's negativity, the believer finally cracks under enough pressure and loses all of its formerly held certainty. By paragraph 572, enlightenment is declared to hold an irresistible authority over faith, but this is not because it has actually arrived at the full truth and exposed the others being totally truthless. Instead, enlightenment simply spreads to the believer, who is, in a certain sense, now rationally liberated from the split consciousness which it formerly had to be caught up in regardless of what the skeptic told us. For Hegel says himself, as a matter of fact, the result of the enlightenment is rather to do away with the thoughtless or rather non-notional separation which was present in faith all along. The believing consciousness weighs and measures by a twofold standard because it had two sorts of eyes, two sorts of ears, and spoke with two different voices because it was caught up in two different worlds at the same time, both of which were structurally unsatisfactory. The first of those worlds was, of course, the non-sensuous perception um, of its own non-notional thoughts 
of that beyond which it could not understand but could only have faith exists. Well, the second world it was caught up in, which was equally problematic, was a world solely composed of sense contents without notional comprehension. This ironic coincidence of polar opposites is what really, I think, caused the believer to crack under pressure and have its own sort of enlightenment, albeit one which is not exactly like what the skeptic was trying to force on it. Well, paragraph 573, we find that after faith had been expelled from its own kingdom, it had ironically ended up in the same place as the Enlightenment, in a state of yearning for the empty beyond of an absolute void without any qualification. But whereas the enlightened rationalist considers himself to be satisfied with this result, the believer is unsatisfied. But upon closer examination, we find that the enlightened has also crossed over into the position of the unsatisfied yearning of the believer. And this unsatisfied yearning, which is spread to the enlightened as well, will take us into the next chapter.